Hey guys, welcome to installment number two of me basically just reading AP Psych notes and trying to teach you stuff. Well, basically trying to study for myself. We're finishing up section one and potentially starting section two. We'll see how far we get. Um, basically the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Psychiatrists can prescribe medicine to you and psychologists can necessarily. A psychiatrist has gone to college for the um, chemical parts, like they, they know the things that someone who works in a pharmacy would know, versus a psychologist knows those things but that wasn't the main focus of their field of study. They both have doctorate degrees but one is licensed to prescribe medication and one may not be. One is licensed to recommend that you get medication and recommend you to go see a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist is licensed to actually write you the prescription. Um, Dorothy Dix helped with conditions of asylums and therapy. I believe this was the lady that disguised herself as somebody who was mentally ill to get put into an asylum and then was there for several months, and when she managed to get out, she wrote about how bad the conditions were there, because for a while, asylums weren't designed to help people, they were just designed to contain them, and keep them from hurting other people. And so, now they are not even called asylums, and they're basically just so much better. Martin Seligman started the positive psychology which explores positive emotions character traits and institutions so he was also somebody i talked about it in the previous video that um well positive psychology is just a, a way of doing psychology in it and it helps uh when psychologists do active listening and, like, really pay attention to what their, um, patients are saying to them. Um, then we have some careers, the careers that you can have if you get a degree in psychology. So we have some basic research careers, which are cognitive psychologists that study thought processes. Developmental psychologists that study age-related behavioral changes, so they would study how the brain, how the behavior of a six-year-old is different from that of someone who's 17 versus that of someone who's 36 versus that of someone who's 59, and, and why. Educational psychologists are um, psycho study psychological processes involved in learning, so uh, they would be more involved in studying how people learn and then why someone with ADHD might have trouble learning because of the educational way that they have trouble relating to something. Um, an experimental psychologist investigates a variety of basic behavioral processes in humans and other animals to compare us to other animals and try to see different things and what happens when different things happen. Um, psychometric psychologists study the methods and techniques used to acquire psychological knowledge. So they try to make sure that experiments are valid and repeatable and um you know that when an experiment is done it's trustworthy and that we can know that the results of the experiment are actually true and if they need to redo an experiment to test and make sure that it's true then they will do that and social psychologists study our actions in relation to others then we have applied research careers which is Forensic psychologists, which apply psychological principles to legal issues, and I think I'm supposed to be taking a forensic science class this term, but I don't know if that's going to happen or not because of all this stuff. Health psychologists um, 
They are psychology's contribution to promoting health and preventing disease. So they would say something like how um, being mentally stressed can actually affect your body's overall health and put you more at risk of contracting a disease. Like being overly stressed and full of anxiety can affect your immune system negatively. Um, an industrial organizational psychologist studies the relationship between people and their working environment, which is um, a job position that when I first started learning about psychology, I uh, deeply thought about doing, and now I'm not sure if I will, but it's still something that's like on the shelf for me if I need to. Um, a neuropsycho neuropsychologist studies the relationship between neurological processes and behavior. So neurological processes specifically the way that the neurons fire and the electrical impulses are sent through the synapses and all the different that stuff. Uh, rehabilitation psychologists work with people who have lost optional function on I've lost something function after an accident, illness, or other events. So, I think it's supposed to say optimal function, but basically it's, um, if you have an event, so rehabilitation psychologists would probably work with people who, um, have a car accident and they get a concussion and then they need to relearn some things, or, um, if you have a heart attack or a stroke and you need to relearn some things, not only is it the relearning of it, but that's hard, which is more of a physical thing, but also a mental thing, but also the frustration that comes with knowing that you used to know how to do that and not being able to do that now, even though you know you used to do it, you know, you know, you used to be able to do it and you don't like you logically understand why, but, but you don't feel like it should be this way. You know, that's where a rehabilitation psychologist would come in. A school psychologist is there for the assessment of an intervention for children in educational settings. I personally believe, personally believe that every school should have a psychologist within it. Um, for many, many years, I went to a school that did not have a psychologist, and um, there was one year where there was a psychologist there because she was um, trying to, she needed to do some, uh, like, student work, and so she was still in college, but she was doing some, like, on-the-job experience work, and so she was kind of volunteering with us, and, um, that was definitely a much better year for me, like, it wasn't better because at the time I didn't really trust mental health professionals, but it was better because I knew that there was someone I could talk to when something was going wrong. I didn't talk to her, but I knew that I could if I absolutely needed to. Um, that I could tell somebody that stuff wasn't going right. Because you know when you have to tell a, a teacher that something's going wrong or that something just isn't the way you think it should be? It feels like tattling, but the to a to a school psychologist that's literally their job and um then they can decide if the thing that you think is wrong has to do with more with you or has to do with more with another student but um at the new school that I went to later where I met a school psychologist she was like super super helpful because I actually had a lot of mental breakdowns at school and um there are actually two people at my school that are specifically for just like general counseling but then we also have some people that are there for um like through badger care um I have a friend that has both um has a lot of mental illness and they had their psych their like psych counseling meetings at school during the school day um, with a counselor there also. So I just think it's very, very important 
to to have your students have access to that and I really wish that the school that I went to would hire one but um, they can't really because of the way that their guidelines for uh, anybody that works there work. <laughs> Uh, a sport psychologist is somebody that uh, studies psychological factors that influence and are influenced by participation in sports and other physical activities. And then helping professions are clinical psychologists, which promotes psychological health in individuals, groups, and organizations, community psychologists that deal with broad problems of mental health in community settings, and counseling psychologists that help people adjust to life transitions or make lifestyle changes. Oh, okay, so I have my FRQ prompt, and then I have my FRQ answers too, I think. Um, So I think um uh no I don't. Well basically I, I, I remember what the prompt was now. Um and it was talking you had to Oh yeah, never mind. So I'll read you the prompt and then I'll read you my response and um, I think I did pretty good but you know it was um, the 9th or 10th month. It was September of 2019 so that's a long time ago. Um, so an FRQ is a free response question if you didn't know that and that's a big part of the AP test. So our prompt was, Michael Joseph Jackson was born on August 29th, 1958 in Gary, Indiana to a large African-American working class family. His mother, Catherine Jackson, was a homemaker and devout Jehovah's Witness. His father, Joseph Jackson, had been a guitarist but had put aside his musical aspirations to provide for his family as a crane operator. Believing his sons had talent, he molded them into a musical group in the early 1960s. Michael joined his siblings when he was five years old and emerged as the group's lead vocalist. Older brother Marlon also became a member of the group, which evolved into the Jackson Five. Behind the scenes, Joseph Jackson pushed his sons to succeed. He was also reportedly known to become violent with them. Michael and his brothers spent endless hours rehearsing and polishing up their act. At first, the Jackson Five played local gigs and built a strong following. At the top of his game, creatively and commercially, Michael Jackson signed a $5 million endorsement deal with Pepsi-Cola. He, however, was badly injured while filming a commercial for the Soto Giant in 1984, suffering burns to his face and scalp. Jackson had surgery to repair his injuries and is believed to have begun experimenting with plastic surgery around this time. His face, especially his nose, would become dramatically altered in the coming years. At this point in his life, it was also discovered that Michael suffered from both lupus, a chronic autoimmune disease, and vitiligo, a disease that causes the loss of skin color and blotches. Raised as a Jehovah's Witness, Jackson was a shy and quiet person offstage. He was never truly comfortable with the media attention he received and rarely gave interviews. By the late 1980s, Jackson had created his own fantasy retreat, a California ranch called Neverland. There he kept exotic pets such as a chimpanzee named Bubbles and had his own amusement rides. To some, it seemed that Jackson perhaps was exploring a second childhood. He sometimes opened up the ranch for children's events. Rumors swirled around him, including that he was lightening the color of his skin to appear more white and slept in a special chamber to increase his lifespan. Explain how each of the following psychological perspectives might explain Michael's behavior. Psychoanalytic, biological, evolutionary, behavioral, cognitive, humanistic, and sociocultural approach. And this is how the FRQs on the AP test usually will be. Um, at least one of them will be asking you to use the seven approaches of psychology to explain how they explain the behavior of the person in the prompt. This one just happens to be Michael Jackson because my AP teacher really likes him. So what I wrote was, according to the psychoanalytic approach, which focuses on behavior springing from unconscious drives and conflicts, Michael Jackson may have been reacting to his childhood as an adult. 
making Neverland and doing things others might find to be childish could be a re reaction to his childhood, which he spent most of working and performing, thereby not doing many of the things most children get to do. Because Michael had lupus, which is an autoimmune disorder, it may have affected his brain and actions. This would illustrate a biological perspective, which looks at how the body and brain enable emotions, memory, and sensory experiences. I put a question mark by this one because I wasn't sure how accurate it was. And I still am not. <laughs> Michael's father was a hard worker, extremely motivated and full of drive. The evolutionary perspective might notice that these traits are found in Michael as well, showing how natural selection worked in his family. Michael's mother was a Jehovah's Witness and she raised her son to be one as well. By observing his mother, Michael learned to behave in a quiet and reserved manner, which illustrates the behavioral perspective. And um, for all of these three, my teacher wrote notes, so um, they're a bit questionable, but it was also my first time doing it, so. When he was injured during the Pepsi-Cola incident, something could have happened to Michael's brain, changing his, the way his memory worked and forcing him to think about repressed memories more than he wanted to. This might be something a person using the cognitive perspective would notice, and as it appears to how our brains encode, process, store, and retrieve information. And she wrote, is there evidence on that one? Because she wasn't... That one's not really, that doesn't really make sense, you know. Um, the humanistic perspective looks at how we m meet our needs for love and acceptance and achieve self-fulfillment. Michael was afraid his issues would make people dislike him, so he tried to hide his vitiligo with a glove, bleaching his skin, and wearing a wig. And the sociocultural perspective studies how behavior and thinking vary across situations and cultures. Michael's music changed along with the times and his family situations, beginning with more flashy dramatic songs and moving to more slow, meaningful music as the years passed. And, um, this one's a little bit shorter than the previous one, but my voice is giving out and we've also finished section one. So I hope that was helpful to you. That was definitely helpful to me because I always forget all of the names of the psychologists and what they do. So it was good to remind myself of that. I hope you enjoyed the video and please come back for more. Yeah.